Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Here again in Kentucky. And this uh, this uh, next Sunday, next Saturday, seven days from now, six days from now, will be the ordinations for the priesthood at 10 o'clock in the morning on June the 26th. Our first ordinations uh, since the founding of the seminary at the beginning of the resistance here in Kentucky. We have had uh, two other priests, uh, three other priests who were ordained who came from this seminary, not one ordained in India, and uh, but they were ordained with us, the other two outside of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel. But it's our first ordinations here in the United States, and the first ordinations for actual members of our community for the continuation of the Society of St. Tent Marian Corps. And so there'll be two priests by the grace of God ordained on a Saturday. Right now, they begin their retreat, their Ignatian retreat. A priest and a friend is preaching a retreat in uh, northern Maine uh, in a cabin to the three to be ordained this next Saturday. So the two deacons to be ordained priests and the one subdeacon to be ordained deacon. So please keep them in your prayers during the course of this retreat as they're uh, uh, preparing for the holy priesthood. Also next Sunday, the 10 a.m. Mass will be the, the first time we'll have a Mass from one of our new priests. So Father, uh, the future Father Noah Cook will be celebrating the 10 a.m. Mass uh, next Sunday, his first Holy Mass, and uh, the beginning of a new stage in the battlefield of Lady Mount Carmel Seminary and of the a movement forward of our battle of the resistance against modernism and building up the kingdom of Christ uh, preparing for the next stage in the battle of spreading our holy faith. In the epistle for this fourth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's letter of the Romans chapter 8. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that will be revealed in us. For the eager longing of creation awaits the revelation of the sons of God. For creation was made subject to vanity, not by its own will, but by reason of him who made it subject, in hope, because creation itself also will be delivered from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. For we know that all creation groans and travails in pain until now. Not only it, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel. Take that to St. Luke, chapter 5. At that time, while the crowds were present, pressing upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genezareth, and he saw two boats moored by the lake. But the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that was Simon's, he besought him to put out a little from the land. And sitting down, he began to teach the crowds from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, Go out into the deep and lower your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, the whole night through we have toiled and have taken nothing. But thy word I will lower the net. When they had done so, they enclosed a great number of fishes, but their net was breaking. And they beckoned to their comrades in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had made. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, henceforth thou shalt catch men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left all and followed him. <coughs> That's what the word that he's really done. So a few considerations taken today primarily from St. Ambrose. So this today is a day in which our Lord begins to do his first great work of saving souls and beginning his true public ministry. 
And today they decided to get into a boat. He got into the boat that was Simon's. And there are multiple boats. <coughs> There's the boat of Simon, then there was the boat of his friend, <coughs> the James and John. But he got into the boat that was Simon's. And St. Ambrose says, what happened before he got into that boat? And what is the condition of the boat? This boat is a boat that is run by fishermen. And what we find, the first thing we note about them, says St. Ambrose, is they were toiling all the night. St. Augustine speaks about it as well. That, that for the first condition of one who is going to be chosen as a disciple or apostle of Christ, is that he must toil. They must work. They have an old sign used to say, look busy, Jesus is coming. When our Lord Jesus Christ comes, those who do not look busy, we know exactly what shall happen to them. They shall receive eternal judgment, and they shall be condemned. And this teaching goes back to the very beginning of our Holy Church. What was happening when our Lord showed up? Even Saul of Tarsus, who was a very wicked man, and Saul of Tarsus, who wanted to destroy the church of Christ, he was working. He was toiling in order that he might bring an end to the church of Christ. And as he was on his way with letters to bring about the capturing of the followers of Christ, he was knocked off his horse and was changed into a saint. Notice also this, as St. Augustine, <coughs> what did Christ say to Saul? Saul, Saul, where persecutest thou me? And every time that he is communicating, St. Ambrose says in his sermon, Note this one thing. There's one time on the boat when our Lord Jesus Christ does nothing. And this is when he is sleeping. This boat undergoes all kinds of different things. The boat is tossed in the waves. The boat has, has uh, the, the sails of faith that carry it forward. The boat has all kinds of conditions in which it finds itself always troubled. Sometimes under the boat there are no fish. And there are always fishermen trying to catch fish and they're lettering down their nets and they're letting down their nets and they're letting down their nets and they are toiling and toiling and toiling but they cannot catch fish. Another time the Lord speaks to them and they let down their nets and there is a great catch of fish. But when is it that nothing happens? When they are sleeping. For St. Ambrose says, the sleeping, Christ sleeps for the mediocre. He sleeps for the mediocre, he is asleep. But at some point, what happens? Remember when our Lord Jesus Christ is sleeping on this boat? He is sleeping on the boat, and what happened? The apostles began to be worried that they were going to sink, and the waves were so bad that they determined that they were not strong enough to take care of this problem themselves that they weren't able to overcome the problem. Christ pulls out the fish from the water, and Christ ends the storm. They were experienced fishermen, and they thought they could make it through the storm without Christ. They thought they had enough knowledge and experience. They knew that Lake of Genesaret. They knew that Sea of Galilee very well. But this storm was bigger than anyone they had seen before. It was more violent. It was one tossed up and brought about by the devil. It wasn't like a normal storm. And finally they awoke from their sleep, to St. Ambrose. They awoke from their mediocrity. They awoke from their sleep and they went and they said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But notice that he does, and our Lord himself said also concerning the, 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 the shepherds, that if they are not toiling, if they are not working in the vineyards, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he send laborers into the harvest. There must be laborers in the harvest. There must be a toiling upon the ship. And when the Holy Church of Christ becomes corrupt, what happens is the toiling somehow stops. The labor somehow stops. And as the toiling and the labor stops, they believe that somehow we, we, we were getting good results before. Why can't we continue to get good results? You must labor, labor, and labor, whether there are results or not results. 
So when Christ told St. Peter, Simon, the future St. Peter, Simon, let down your nets for a catch. He didn't say just let down the nets, but let down the nets for a catch. He is not let down the nets only because Christ told him to let down the nets. He isn't let down the nets because it was just a habit, but he was down the nets with it for a great catch. And here St. Ambrose says, something happened to Saint to Simon. He had toiled all the night, and he could not catch a single fish. But when Christ told him, let down the nets for a catch, he didn't just let down the nets in order to be nice to the prophet. He didn't just let down the nets in order that he might be obedient to the prophet. He let down the nets for a catch. When we fight, what do we fight for? We are fighting for the salvation of souls. We are fighting for a catch. When our Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, he went for a catch. We read also in the epistles and in, in the scripture reading today about David and Goliath. We begin to read about David and Goliath. The Philistines set themselves in a camp on one side, the Jews set themselves in a camp on the other, and there were three brothers of David. One of them was Aminadab. There were two other brothers of David. We don't remember their names. But they were the older and more important brothers, and they were there, and they were with Saul. And there was a great so, so bunch of so, soldiers with, with the Jews who were in the army of God. A Philistine came down named Goliath, and he was ten feet tall. Six cubits and a few sickles tall. He was ten feet tall. And he had great armor, and he had a massive sword, and he had an armor bearer, and he, had, he was very tough and strong. And he came this day before the Jews, and he said, send down some man to fight me. And out of the 40,000 Jewish soldiers, not one man went down to fight. Not one went down to fight. But it says in the, rather in the book of Kings that they were dismayed, and Saul was dismayed. And the three older brothers of, of, uh, of David were dismayed, and they were not ready to fight. We are in a time of great battle. There are souls in need of Christ everywhere in the world. We need soldiers that are going to toil. They will not always win. They will not always have victory. They will often throw down their nets, and they shall pull up nothing but a net. They shall go here and go there. There shall be many disappointments and many struggles. But when the Lord God comes, he's going to ask a question. What have you been doing all the night? What have you been doing all the night? We were toiling. We were working. For St. Ambrose, and this is the theme of so many of the fathers of the church, St. Ambrose says there's one thing, and St. Gregory Great says the same thing, that God cannot stand, and that is those who are unwilling to work. Those that don't put their hand to the plow. And there is one of the challenges today, we must have souls to put their hand to the plow. We have to put the hand to the plow. We have to work, and we have to work at our salvation in fear and trembling. And there will be many struggles along the way. But there must be a working, there must be a fighting. And somehow, in our holy church today, the church remains holy as unholy souls in it. And are not willing to fight, not willing to toil, not willing to work, even when there is not, does not seem to be any benefit. But there must be a toiling. Now the ship is, in the, is, in the, is put off from the land. A great crowd comes around Christ. And then our Lord says that St. Peter and St. Peter alone, there are twelve apostles, they're all priests of God. They're all supposed to be fishermen. And today he's going to teach them, I will make you a fisher of men. This is the day when St. Lord Jesus Christ says to St. Peter and the apostles, and all apostles, no matter what their former occupation was. St. Thomas was not a fisherman. He was an architect and a builder. St. Matthew was not a fisherman. He was a tax collector. But the vast majority of apostles, they were fishermen. And all 12 of them, including Matthew and including uh, the uh, St. Thomas, they became fishers of men. You will become fishers of men. We must be fishermen. 
And fishermen don't always see the prey. They don't see the catch. They don't know when they put their net down whether they will gather a catch or not. But they know what they must do. And they know that they are on a boat. And that in this boat they will, must remain if they wish to live. And if they go outside of this boat they shall drown. And into this boat they must take the, the catch of fish to save them from the troubled waters of this world, as St. Ambrose. <clears throat> and, they, and the fisherman always works. <clears throat> he toils. And all of the, the fishermen also, in our world, fishermen is just another occupation. But in India and other parts of the world, the fisherman is one of the lowest occupations. The fisherman is a very despised man. He's a worker, but he's one of the lowest workers. He's one of the most despised workers. Though he is a worker, he's at the bottom. And the fisherman must be ready to do the humble tasks. The fisherman must be ready to do... Well, what, was it, what were they doing, by the way? Again, St. Ambrose points this out. When Christ came, the fishermen had fished all night. Now it was the early morning. You used to see this in Versailles in India, when the fishermen would come in and make the notes exactly like they did 2,000 years ago. In the early morning when you walk out on the shore, you see all the nets stretched out on the shore, and all the fishermen with their toes, they grab the, they grab the, the, uh, the tie with their toes, the net. They use their two toes, their two feet, and their two hands together, like four hands, in which they tie. They pull, them up, pull the, the net with their toes, and they grab their hands, and they fix the net, using their toes and their hands every morning, and fix the net, repair the rips in the net. So when Christ came, they were repairing the nets. They had spent all the night toiling. Then he told them, get into the boat. And they got into the boat. But St. Ambrose says, now they had toiled, and this is very good. And they were working, and that is very good. But what happened as a result of their work? Nothing. And this is another theme in the working and following of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember when our Lord went to Gideon and told him to form an army. Gideon did form an army. But too many people came. And God said to Gideon, if you win with these 20,000 or 30,000 volunteers against 60,000 enemy, you will believe that you won the fight. But in our battle with God, only God wins the fight and not us. Therefore, the Lord was not going to accept that even though we must toil and we must work and we must continue to be busy at all times, even though we must do these things, our toil does not bear fruit. Our toil does not bring victory. Our toil does not make it possible for there to be a catch of fish. And hence, he says to St. Peter, <clears throat> says St. Ambrose, and St. Peter alone, Duke and Altum, let down your fish, your net, into the deep. Lay your net down into the very deep. And when you lay your net down into the deep, for a great catch, where is the deep, says St. Ambrose? It is the depth of his faith. He's got to have a deep faith. The Lord wants St. Peter to have a deep faith. When St. Peter has a deep faith, the brethren are, con are converted. And when St. Peter does not have a deep faith, there is disaster everywhere in the world. The last Holy Father, who was a great saint, who had a deep faith, was Giuseppe Sarto, who became St. Pius X. And he had a deep faith. And that deep faith of that one man slowed down Vatican II by 50 years, <clears throat> saved hundreds of millions of souls, <clears throat> gave the antidote and the answer to modernism, the attack of the devil in our times, brought back St. Thomas Aquinas, brought back the most sacred weapons that we have, against the evils of our times. It was the heart of one man who was a simple parish priest from Riese near Venice, who was a peasant, who was a son of a tailor. And what did he do? He, he, he dug deep into the Duke and Altum. He led this church down into the deep. And when he led the church down into the deep, out came Pushindi. And out came the requirement and that we should receive Holy Communion every day if possible, bringing back an end to the, to the corruption of only rare Holy Communion, bringing back the Holy uh, the, the Catechism, uh, the Catechism, the Catechism, the Catechism, ten encyclicals on the Catechism that he wrote in the course of only a few years of papacy, ten years of papacy, and that they brought back the, the actual means to combat Satan in our times. 
And he gave us the answer, St. Pius X, what we must do to become saints in our times and to stand firm in the troubled waters of our times. He said these words to the Pope alone, <laughs> says St. Ambrose. There are twelve apostles, and every apostle should duke an altum. Every priest should duke an altum, and the fathers speak much about this. Every priest must dive into the deep. Every priest must dive into the supernatural life. That's why, it's, that's why the church teaches there's a mortal sin for the priest to miss his bravery, but it's not a mortal sin to miss his mass. He must say his bravery every day. He is not required to say his mass every day. That is a custom. But he is required to say that bravery every day. He must duke an altum. <clears throat> and then he must be a man of prayer. And he must be a man of faith. He must spend time in the presence of Christ so that he might duke an altum, that he might lead into the deep. And this is required of every priest. But St. Ambrose says, while it is required of every priest, Christ spoke the word specifically to one priest, and that is the Holy Father in Rome. And he said to that priest, you must do canaltum. You are the one who must dive into the deep. And if you don't personally do it, the whole world will suffer. And so when he made to St. Peter a pope, he asked him, Simon, the son of John, do you personally lovest thou me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And because he loves him, he can feed the sheep. Because he loves him, he can take the net now. And he can throw it in the deep. Because every pope throws the net in the deep. But not that they might receive a capture. But he throws his net in the deep that he might receive a capture. He must have belief in that capture. And faith will feel the sails, sails, says St. Ambrose. And faith will carry that boat to where the sheep are. To where the fish that are ready to be captured are. And they will go after the fish. So there must, must pray that the Holy Church, in our Holy Church, that there be vocations. We need vocations. Souls that are going to do a canaltum, that are going to toil in the day and in the night. And that are going to work for the salvation of souls amidst all kinds of adversity. And even though we fail in so many of our endeavors, we'll continue to toil and continue to toil. And remember also that our toil, all the toil that we do, is of no value in and of itself. It will not produce any results unless we sit and listen to the words of Christ. Pray that there be a sitting and listening to the words of Christ, and that there be a duke and altar, and the ship will be tossed by the waves, as in Ambrose. It's going to be tossed by the waves, the nature of the ship. It's going to have all kinds of experiences. There will be times even when we have to do like St. Peter did, and walk outside the ship on the water in order to go to Christ. Or when we find that Jesus Christ is on the water, like St. Peter did in one storm, we'll walk off the ship and go where Christ is, because we are attached to Jesus Christ. And that's what Archie Lefebvre did. Archie Lefebvre walked to Christ. And when he walked to Christ, he saved the church. He saved the priesthood. And so there must be a walking to Christ in the middle of the storm. And then Christ goes back with St. Peter into the boat. And so there must be a saving of our holy church. Right now the church is morally corrupt in all kinds of ways. But what is the cause of this moral corruption? It is the loss of faith. And in order to bring the church back to its senses, to bring the church back to what Christ wants it to be, there must be souls who have faith who are going to toil in the day and in the night. And this is what we must really strive to create in our little seminary, Lady Mount Carmel, is weak souls ready to toil in the day and in the night. And sometimes it is difficult, but we must continue to toil in the day and the night. And then God will bring about the victory. God will bring about the salvation of souls. He will bring about the great capture and we must have faith. And remember also, as St. Ambrose says, while well, every priest has holiness, and every priest has a power of priesthood, there is one priest that matters, and that is why each Catholic has an obligation to pray for that one priest, who is the Holy Father in Rome. And right now, that is the wicked Pope Francis. He must be prayed for by each one of us. He is in every Mass that we celebrate. He is also in our bravery, and he must be in all of our daily prayers and our sacrifices, etc., that God speaks to that priest, the priest who is the bishop of Rome, and that one day he will obey heaven. 
For it is every, every priest must do an altum. Every priest must try to have a capture of fish. Every priest must imitate the priestly side of St. Peter. But there is only one St. Peter. And we must pray for the Holy Father that he actually truly obeys heaven and that his heart finally listens to heaven and that he with faith even though there has been nothing but failure ever since Vatican II, and it really a new series of failures since Giuseppe Sarto, St. Pius X, went into heaven in 1914. And ever since that time, the church has been declining. And that, and that there must be a new St. Pius X for our holy church. And the, each pope, including Pope Francis, can become this new St. Pius X by doing what? Duke and Altum. Let out into the deep. Listen to the words of Christ. Have faith in His power. Be toiling in the night. Be toiling in the day. Be ready to efface all storms. Do not fall into the sleep of mediocrity. And fight for the kingdom of Christ. Our Lord said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. That He said, laborers into the harvest. And He will send laborers. It is certainly the, the, the desire of our children of the family found in the society of St. Pius X, which we truly continue in the SSPX Marian Corps. That we be truly apostles of Jesus and Mary, to toil in the kingdom of Christ, to toil in the vineyard, to toil on the sea, to toil in the night, to toil in the day, until such time that by the grace of God he chooses to bear the fruit of the toil. And he decides one day, today is the day there shall be a great catch. But we must be casting the net every day, and casting the net every day, and casting the net every day, and fixing the net, casting the net, and fixing the net. Casting the net and preparing the net. And so that we need all those holy sacraments. And we need to have complete faith in God and to continue in this battle. And also keep in your prayers, we could mention in the announcement earlier, the father of Reverend Mr. Mario Parker, who's, uh, who died last week and uh, was buried yesterday. So the, the, uh, we drove, uh, speaking of the toil, we drove through the night last night, got back here at 7 o'clock this morning. And uh, so we returned here at 7 o'clock this morning from the funeral yesterday in, in uh, Wisconsin. And so, uh, you know, pray for the Green Bay, Wisconsin, pray for the repose of the soul of Mr. Uh, Joseph Parker, who had been sick and dying for the last seven years, and only did many, many times. But then he finally died this last week and was buried, uh, received his funeral with the, all the seminarians, Reverend Mr. Mario there uh, in the, call it, uh, yesterday. And then uh, the, the, after the funeral, the three that were being ordained headed off to Maine to go on their retreat. And the rest of us came down here, back to the seminary. And then also pray for Our Lady Mount Carmel, for the size of St. Pius Marian Corps, that the Lord sent laborers into the harvest. We are weak sinners, and uh, but nonetheless, God, God uses the weak to confound the strong. And let us be strong in our holy faith and try to increase and, and and, and to kill the, 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 the disease of mediocrity, which we all have to fight, and have confidence in the faith of, of God to conquer the enemies. And the Blessed Virgin Mary will have our victory, and that's our desire to be the apostles of Jesus and Mary, the ones who will carry that victory, who will be allowed to be some of those who carry that victory into the world, and, her, and when her victory comes soon over the enemy, and, and, the, and Russia is converted to Christ, the Pope finally Dukes and Altum, who's been asking for many, many years, it's almost 100 years now that this request has gone on of our Holy Lady of Fatima, but it will be done before these 100 years are out, and there shall be the victory of Mary. In the meantime, we must continue to work and work and work and, 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 and watch and pray, lest we enter into temptation and have victory. So in any case, pray for the priests in general, but especially pray for the Holy Father, who received the direct command that's in the Gospel today, Duke and Altum, and also pray that there be warriors that are ready to fight for Christ and God who can bring from any ranks, including the shepherd and the musician. There was a shepherd and musician that came to the camp today. And the shepherd and musician named David came to the camp of the soldiers. And the shepherd and musician showed the soldiers what it means to fight. And our Lord Jesus Christ wants shepherds and musicians. He wants shepherds and musicians to conquer the enemies of God. And so we pray for shepherds and musicians to come to us and to be able to be warriors in the army of Christ to conquer the enemies as Christ raised the young David, shepherd and musician, and, and to defeat the enemy of, as an instrument to defeat the enemies of God. We pray for many of them to come into our battlefield during this time. And then pray for the, the especially with those two deacons to be ordained priests next week, on June the 26th, by the grace of God. And of course, all should come and invite, invite others to the ordinations at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, 
afterwards at the feast and so on, the celebration throughout the day. And then on Sunday, the next uh, 10 a.m. Mass, next Sunday, will be with the new future Father uh, Noah Cook celebrating his first Mass and, uh, and as, as the high Mass of next Sunday at 10 a.m. Closing, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.